Well, good evening, everyone. As just mentioned, we have a very simple subject tonight. <laughs> Merely the cosmic mystery of karma and reincarnation. You may have heard sometimes in introducing his talks, or, and depending on the topic, our master might say, tonight's subject is a vast one. So I think we can safely assume that our, this applies to our topic as well. And to start off, I wonder in connection with tonight's subject, again, the cosmic mystery of karma and reincarnation, if there's not some generally universal response to this title, where our brains hear the word mystery, which creates a certain excitement, and which perk up again at the word reincarnation, immediately conjuring up thoughts of who we are and, and so forth. Well, the word karma kind of drops out in the, <laughs> in the middle somewhere. So when Branche Andy comes up and makes the announcement, what our brains hear is the mystery of reincarnation. Yeah, ooh, that sounds like an interesting topic. You know? Where'd that karma go? <laughs> yeah. No problem. <laughs> Although the word doesn't entirely disappear, rather, again, if we observe, it merely retreats somewhat uneasily into the background. In any case, they say sometimes it's good when you want to unravel any mystery to start at the beginning. And so listening to our master's words, he said, the spirit was invisible, existing alone in the home of infinity. He piped to himself, the ever-new, ever-entertaining song of perfect, beatific bliss. As he sang to himself through his voice of eternity, he wondered if aught but himself were listening and enjoying his song. Even as thus he thought, lo. And as Brother Nilananda mentioned last night, through that thought, then it happened. We and all creation came into being. And in the Christian Bible from the Gospel of St. John, the very first words are what? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so that song or word or the own vibration, that Holy Ghost, went out and became manifest in all the three worlds of the physical, astral, and causal realms. Every living thing containing and expressing an individualized spark of that divine intelligence. Now this sounds all right, but something happened to those individual sparks when they went out. Something very significant. Through Maya, or Satan, or however it may be called in the various religious traditions, those sparks lost their identity with spirit and became identified with their individualized created forms. And in Sanskrit, this state is called avidya, or individual ignorance. But to make matters worse, so to speak, spirit bestowed one other quality on those individualized sparks, and that is the power of free will and free choice. And this is where and when for us the principle of karma or that law of cause and effect came into being. And if we stop and think about this, if we as those individualized souls, if we think we're this perishable body, and if through that individual ignorance we know nothing beyond this body, then throughout all those incarnations from the beginning, our free will choices are invariably going to be connected with providing safety, pleasure, happiness to this form, regardless of the consequences. So summing up this cosmic process, in the Self-Realization Fellowship Lessons, our Master wrote, when spirit alone existed, he said, I want to become manifest. So by his law of evolution, he expressed himself in various inanimate forms until he eventually became plant life. Then he thought, I express life and beauty in the plant, but I want to enjoy motion. Thus his feet were released from the earth, and he manifested his animal life. In nature, Guruji said, God first realized his beauty and his sensibility. His voice began to sing in the nightingale, but he said, well, I sing, but I am not conscious of what I sing. 
So God became man. Then he began to express his reason. In man's power of thought, God's omnipresence is expressed more than in other forms. Then God became the superman, who realizes his origin and oneness with God. In the superman, God is able to express his omnipresence, for he knows, even in a human body, that he is present in all things. And then our master said, how to attain to that divine consciousness of your omnipresent God nature is what these lessons teach you. Now, the thing we fail to take into account because of that hidden and mysterious law of reincarnation is that although as seemingly separated sparks, our essence is still eternal, we are still unable to realize and remember because a veil comes down over each individual incarnation. And so we we don't remember throughout those various stages of evolution the inconceivable number and length of time those multifarious existences took place. In fact, our Master says the Hindu scriptures maintain that it requires eight million incarnations in lower life forms, that evolutionary process of spirit itself before the soul essence gains birth in the unique human body. Eight million. But it doesn't stop there. After that point, we then start to pass through what he said are countless incarnations in human form as well. So I thought if we feel a bit tired at times, (laughs) it's no wonder But to step out even further, our master relates how those births and deaths take place within certain cosmic cycles called days and nights of Brahma. Similar, he said, to the day and night in the book of Genesis, where during a single day, all creation is in manifestation, like now. And then he said, during the equally long night, spirit withdraws all creation back into itself. And then when a new universal day dawns, we and he pick up where we all left off. An interesting little footnote here, you probably have heard of the well-known astronomer of some years ago, Carl Sagan, who himself talked about this once and said, the Hindu religion is the only one of the world's great faiths dedicated to the idea that the cosmos itself undergoes an immense, indeed an infinite number of deaths and births and rebirths, he said. He said, it is the only religion in which the time scales correspond to those of modern scientific cosmology. Its cycles run from our ordinary day and night to a day and night of Brahma, 8.64 billion years long, longer than the age of the Earth or the Sun, and about half the time since the Big Bang. And there are much longer time scales still, And he said, a millennium before Europeans were willing to divest themselves of the biblical idea that the world was a few thousand years old, the Mayans were thinking of billions and the Hindus of billions. And so our master said that even God is subject in a way to the law of reincarnation. And in fact, he added elsewhere during that so-called cosmic night, he says, God gives all unredeemed souls as well as himself, a long cosmic rest. So the point is, firstly, if we take this all in, we see and, and we're in awe of how inconceivably vast and, and wonderful it all is. But, and even when it comes to cosmic creation, there's, a, there's italics in the universe somewhere. Just as Master's teachings we see when in his talks, he takes us out to the infinite, so to speak, but then brings us back to the essence, to the practical. So the most important point of all this is not to be philosophers and, and admire the vastness of the universe and our own infinite delusion, but rather to realize that all those awe-inspiring yet countless incarnations that we have gone through have created what? Karma in the form of deep-seated tendencies, habits, and samskaras, which again, through the corollary of reincarnation, 
is what brings us back again and 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 again, and again, and again. We could use the next 40 minutes, just have a kind of twisted affirmation, just so, you know. <laughs> Which is what we do, life to life. In fact, our master said once that we might have millions of years of karma pursuing us. Okay, now don't rush for the exits, <laughs> uh, because we've got the, I've got the bad news out of the way at the beginning. Why? Because we're all now, each one of us, at a singular point in our evolution. Where we've started to wake up from that ignorance, our souls have stirred, and we've said, no more. Enough is enough. I want to get control, take control of that process. And we want to become those supermen and women to achieve that last part of spirit's evolution within us. And so the same free will that from the beginning got us into our karmic mess and tied to that endless wheel of reincarnations is the same power that can free us. As our master also said, the wheel, referring, he said, to those ceaseless cycles of Brahma's days and nights, he said, the wheel rotates forever, but one by one, wise men and women slip away from it. And if we think about it, just being here in this room tonight demonstrates, proves that we have already gained a tremendous amount of good karma in our search for truth. Our guru, in fact, said, only those who have acquired great good karma through the good works of many incarnations are drawn to the path of Kriya Yoga. What did he just say? <laughs> Great good karma. Not just good karma, which would be good, really good. We'd all line up for that. But he said, great good karma. And that's better than good. And another thing our being here also very likely tells us is something about our previous incarnations just in case anybody would be interested in knowing about that. <laughs> That's why you all came to this class tonight, right? Our guru said this to a similar audience once. He said, out of millions of people, you have been drawn here because you have had something to do with the Orient and its spiritual teachings before. Some of you will recall the story Brother Bibalananda used to share about how he said when he first met the master while attending our Hollywood temple that afterwards Guruji greeted him with a big smile and then for some unknown reason spoke to him in his native Bengali. And brother said he didn't know, really know what language it was until some time later after he had entered the ashram and when he found out, he said he decided to ask master why he did that. And so he said one day he and some of the other monks were on their way to do some work near where the master was staying and he said how all the way out in the car, Brother Bhimlananda said he kept thinking to himself, when I get there, I'm going to ask him why he spoke to me in Bengali. When I get there, I'm going to ask him why he spoke to me in Bengali. So that when he got there, he, he wouldn't forget when he got in the Master's presence. And so he said when they arrived, got out of the car, there was Guruji waiting for them. And before anyone could say anything, Master said, you were all Bengali babus with me before. But Brother said he was so intent on asking his question that he asked it anyway. <laughs> Master, why did you speak to me in Bengali when the first time I met? <laughs> and then he said, Guruji repeated it again. Okay, I'm not getting to reincarnation just yet. That's just the tease to keep us interested in the karma part a bit longer. So. <laughs> Although going back once more to those days and nights of Brahma, in his autobiography, you might recall how Guruji talks about one of the patron saints of Kashmir, the 14th century Lala Yogeshwari, whose name Guruji translated as Supreme Mistress of Yoga. And fast forwarding for a moment away from the, what Master said, I remembered how Brother Nanamoy once related a story 
about her that he had read from a different source, where he said she had actually talked about remembering lifetimes from as far back for her as during a previous day of Brahma. But to again show that no matter how long we've been at this and how much suffering and heartache, the comfort we will receive in the end will be beyond all measure. And our master said that she herself practiced a technique closely allied to Kriya Yoga and whose liberating efficacy he said she celebrated in numerous quatrains, one of which he translated from her as follows. What acid of sorrow have I not drunk? Countless my rounds of birth and death. Lo, naught but nectar in my cup, quaffed by the art of breath. So, after millions of lives, in millions of years, here we are. And the question is, what do we do to find that same nectar in our cup? Well, I think the first thing is to stop fooling ourselves about karma. We all, I'm sure, have a certain intellectual understanding about it. Yeah, I get it. I do this and this is going to happen. But I think we need to look at ourselves keep looking at ourselves and go beyond that, to come face to face, to look karma square in the eyes, so to speak. And as Sri Yukteswarji once said, to realize and actually and finally admit to ourselves what he said is the inescapability of spiritual law. And when we do that, when we really do that, then we'll understand and accept that it has been and it has always been our own thoughts and actions that are the cause of our suffering or whatever situation we might find ourselves in. That what we sow, every thought, every action, whether in previous lives or in this life or in any future lives, if there are to be any, we will invariably reap. Now, we can either say, whoa, is me, or we can say to ourselves what Master said to each one of us, get busy and weed the garden of your life. On one of his recordings, entitled Be a Smile Millionaire, and I encourage everyone, if you haven't already, get all of the recordings, listen to Guruji's voice, hear how he spoke on these subjects. There's one entitled One Life Versus Reincarnation, I especially recommend, so you hear hear him in his own words, in his own, own voice. In fact, thinking of our dear Merlini Ma, so many times she would reference how she had been listening to one of Guruji's recordings, and here she, she lived with him, she's in tune with him, demonstrated that attunement. But it was yet another way, no doubt, for her to further that attunement, or to live in the beautiful memory and, and, and presence now of her relationship with him. And at the very least, she set an example for us to follow. So they're so wonderful. And so on that particular recording, Be a Smile Millionaire, the Guruji expressed lovingly, but with a certain exasperation for emphasis, the misunderstanding that exists at times about the law of karma and how, okay, we might take that first step and come to accept it. But then he said, we use it as an excuse for our troubles, or for not making the effort to get out of our troubles. We might reason away things by saying, oh, it must be my karma. You know, okay, now what? What do we do about that situation? And so he said on that recording, laugh at delusion. Watch it, and it cannot work on you anymore. Be in that bliss. Stand unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds, and you shall find that God is real. He doesn't mean to hurt you. He has made you in his image. He has made you already what he is. That's what you don't realize because you acknowledge that you are a human being. That's why you have to climb back to God. Deny your errors and what is in the past doesn't belong to you anymore. Why talk of karma and karma? 
And then he said, I'm so tired of Americans talking of karma. <laughs> But then he added and said, India also fell politically because of too much believing in karma. In fact, in the Self-Realization Fellowship Lessons, he talks further along these lines and says something so profound and which takes away any and all mystery from this subject. He said, it is not God who punishes you or rewards you. You are your own judge. You punish yourself through evil thoughts and actions or free yourself through good ones. And he goes on, since man is the judge, no jail of suffering, poverty, or ignorance can hold him if he wants to liberate himself. It is up to him to speak the words, be thou free, and to make the jailer of his wrong convictions obey his command. And so think about this. As he said repeatedly, in so many places, there is no such thing as fate. No such thing as fate. Only destiny that we create ourselves. And so in effect, we are the judge and the jailer, and the prisoner. We, at different times, we can play all three roles. And then Guruji says, in effect, we hold the key to our prison break, to our own escape. And what's so wonderful about this is how liberating, how empowering this understanding is. Within our grasp, through our choices, we hold the power to our future, to our eternal destiny. No one else, nothing else. And of course, we may not be able to control how others will act toward us or the conditions we might face, but we have complete control or the potential to have complete control as to how we will act and react or how we will choose to act or react. And that's what determines that destiny. In his book entitled Metaphysical Meditations, our master gave a beautiful and powerful prayer affirmation regarding this, which reads, Dear Father, whatever conditions confront me, I know that they represent the next step in my unfoldment. There's so much wisdom and peace in that affirmation. So much understanding. Whatever conditions confront me, I know that they represent the next step in my unfoldment. That's that first step, that acceptance. I know that whatever is in my life, we've heard this, I've heard it at some of the different talks this week. Whatever conditions confront me, it's the next step in my unfoldment. And then Guruji says, I will welcome all tests because I know that within me is the intelligence to understand and the power to overcome. And what this knowledge further does is that it also finally reframes what and who God is. People seem so uncomfortable nowadays, maybe more than ever, with the word or idea of God. I don't, I don't know or think if he's terribly bothered by that. In the modern vernacular, in his you know, universal Twitter page, he's still probably getting a lot of hits for or against from all of us in our individual thoughts that we send out or react to that concept or word when we hear it. Plus, in the end, he knows we're all going to melt back into our eternal nature anyway, so that, you know, that, that cosmic time, again, it's on his side. So. But what's so brilliant about our master's teachings is how he explains God to us. Again, that fundamental cause, sat, chit, ananda, ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss. And what Guruji adds to that And what appeals to us is that along with that universal or that impersonal aspect is also a personal component to that divine source of all things that is near and dear, the nearest of the near, the dearest of the dear. And that is actively helping us to attain that karmic freedom. In fact, our master said once, and we heard this The other night as well, if we love God with all our hearts, he wipes out our karma. That's something to think about or to jot down. If we love God, it sounds like a back door into heaven. Like, you know, we don't have to do anything else, meditate anything, you know. Just, I'll just love God and we'll be good, God and I. So, 
But really, if we love God with all our hearts, he wipes out our karma. So the next step in unraveling these mysteries then is how do we learn to love God? Well, as our master says, first, we have to know him. In the Gita, in chapter 2, verse 39, the Lord is Krishna says, The ultimate wisdom of Sankhya I have explained to thee. But now thou must hear about the wisdom of yoga, equipped with which, O Partha, Arjuna, thou shalt shatter the bonds of karma. And as our master explains, Sankhya is that system of Hindu philosophy that explains the why of religion and that Vedanta describes the end to be attained. But Guruji said yoga provides the method for that attainment. And where does that path or method of yoga begin? As always, with yama and niyama, those first two steps of Patanjali's Eightfold Path. Now, this is where it starts getting interesting because, again, it's not just philosophy, it's science. Listen to this. Referring to yama, the don'ts or the power of mental resistance, our guru says, breaking the rules of moral conduct creates not only present misery, but long-lasting karmic effects that bind the devotee to suffering and mortal limitation. And referring to niyama, the dues or the power of mental adherence, he says, niyama provides the yogi with an army of positive spiritual self-discipline to defeat the battalions of evil misery producing ways and the effects of past bad karma. And in the lessons on Kriya, our master gives the results that each individual step of yoga of that eightfold path is meant to give. And what does he say are the results, the scientific results of practicing yama and niyama? Self-control and mental calmness. Now, why would this be important? For the third step, which is asana, being able to hold the body still and comfortable for the practice of the fourth step of pranayama, those life force techniques through which when we practice further and most effectively help us to overcome and neutralize the karmic effects and tendencies and misconceptions from all those millions of past lives. So without having self-control and mental calmness, we can't sit still in meditation. And if we can't sit still in meditation, we can't effectively or as effectively practice Kriya and the other techniques of meditation that lead to our liberation. So you see how scientific the path is. It's not just a question, and again, if we react to God, we react to morality, we react to these things, but it's not merely morality, it's science. It's that divine science. And this brings us to that science of Kriya Yoga, and here's where it gets even more interesting. As our master said, quoting from his autobiography, the Sanskrit root of Kriya is Kri, to do, to act and react. And he said the same root is found in the word karma, the natural principle of cause and effect. Okay, something's going on here. Huh? And what's going on is Guruji's opening the door. He's showing us into the mystery of God's creation and how it's all organized, how from the very beginning again, God sent out creation in the form of what he called that cosmic karma, but how he embedded naturally within that outer form the inner science rooted in love that we can follow to find our way home. It's like with the Om technique of meditation that you learned or reviewed yesterday. Again, in the beginning through that great Om vibration, spirit sent creation out, all things vibrating with the Christ intelligence. But through that technique of meditation, we can follow that same inner path of Om back to our source in Him. And so continuing from that same quote about Kriya then, our master says, Kriya Yoga is thus union or yoga with the infinite through a certain action or right, Kriya. And he says, a yogi who faithfully practices the technique is gradually freed from karma or the lawful chain of cause-effect equilibriums. 
And how does it do that? Guruji said one and the most effective way that it works is that he said it cauterizes or roasts the seeds of karma that become lodged in the spine and brain as we bring that energy into the spine and brain. He said it, it roasts those seeds. And beyond that, through the experience of God that practicing Kriya and the other techniques give us, our future actions are no longer identified with whatever role or form we have, but rather with our newly reawakened inner identity with spirit. So we, we're not leaving any new karmic footprints behind us. And our master said, this then is the real yagya, or fire right, mentioned in the Gita. And of which Mahavatar Babaji said, even a little practice of this dharma, religious right or righteous action will save you from great fear. The colossal sufferings inherent in the repeated cycles of birth and death. And this then brings us to karma's corollary of reincarnation. And so taking up this last portion of our talk tonight, what then is the reason or purpose for reincarnation? Again, quite simply, Guruji says, the most important thing to know about reincarnation is that this life is a new opportunity given by God to destroy the evil and cultivate the good that you have brought with you from past lives. Some of you might be familiar with the epitaph on the tombstone of the famous American Benjamin Franklin, written by himself, in fact, before his death, and considered by many to be the most famous of American epitaphs. And it reads as follows. The body of B. Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here, food for worms. But the work shall not be lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more elegant edition, revised and corrected by the author. Isn't that good? <laughs> And so, like he states, the simple fact is that until we have worked out all that karma, we have to come back, like our master said, to this school of life in order to finish all our various lessons. Guruji said along these lines, when a child that is sent to school fails to make the grade, he has to go back again and again until he passes his examinations. So also, souls who fail to preserve their perfection while in the mortal school of educative entertainment, have to go back for many incarnations until they completely bring out their hidden spirit nature. The immortal soul must win several prizes in maintaining spirit endurance, self-control, detachment, morality, calmness, and spirituality before graduating, and must pass all grades in the earthly school in order to be ready for immortality. And this is what is meant by the so-called Day of Judgment, or Gabriel's trumpet, that is mentioned in the Bible, where at death, the tenor of our life, who we are, what we've been, how much we've loved, all our deeds. It's like, Guruji said, a sound or vibration that becomes our final thought when we leave the body and announces us into that next world. And I was thinking, it's just like here, if, if, if we think that we can just pick up a trumpet or trombone and we're going to blow a clear note through it, that's not going to be very realistic thinking. And so in the same way, we can't just wait till the end of life and think we're, in, we're at the doors of St. Peter that we're going to get it all together. It's more likely, you know, we'll end up in heaven there and... <laughs> you know, wait a minute, I got this, I got this. <laughs> you know. So the point is, the obvious point, is uh, we have to practice. Just like we'd have to practice to make a a good sound out of that, that horn instrument. 
We have to practice throughout our life. Again, that's why yama niyama. Kindness, compassion, faith, courage, love, meditation, service. All these things create a vibration day by day within ourselves that builds into a beautiful symphony of our whole life so that when the final moment comes, no regrets. We can lay everything that we are at the feet of the infinite, feet of the universe, in perfect trust, perfect sincerity, knowing we did our best. And what a beautiful sound that will be. It's like Sri Dayamata said once, we probably have read or heard her. She said, said, when we die, she said, Divine Mother's just going to ask us one question. Did you love me? Not what wrongs we have done. Those will get sorted out. They need to get sorted out, but in the context of that love. Again, she's just going to ask, did you love me? And what does that mean? It also means, did we love each other? Were we a good person? Were we kind? Did we practice... We practice yama niyama because it brings happiness to others as well as ourselves. And so at each and every moment, we are the sum total of all that has gone before, all our actions, all our choices. And it is any unfinished business, so to speak, that will bring us back from the astral world into a family, into a set of conditions that will allow us to continue working out that karma getting those lessons, passing those tests, that we might, as our master said, graduate from this earthly school and receive what he said is our divine PhD. And in fact, he explains in the Gita at length this very process of coming back and how at the moment of physical conception on earth, he said, a flash of light appears in the astral that transmits a pattern which attracts a soul according to that soul's karma and which fits the heredity of the parents and the family line and provides an entry point for that soul to return back into a physical body in order to continue the karmic lessons and experiences not yet finished or learned. Some of you will remember one of our monks, Brother Primamoy, before he passed away some years ago. And I remember how he shared with us once that he said the earliest memory he had was in fact a voice whispering to him, don't touch that light. (laughs) And he didn't elaborate, but no doubt a divine presence was, was there looking out for him. And in the context of an understanding of what Master's explaining, the karmic pattern of that particular flash was not the one ideally suited for him and what he needed to do to work out again whatever karmic lessons he had. Fascinating. Hmm? And so seeing karma and reincarnation in this light allows us to understand why our master said, in reality, karma is not even meant for our harm. Even though, again, as we know all too well, through identification with this form and the that avidya that still troubles us, that that karma can create terrible suffering for us. But Guruji said karma is actually meant for our redemption. And he said the reason is, is that karma puts us in situations, attracts to us certain situations where we can continue working out the lessons that we need to learn that will bring to our attention those areas of our life that are not yet fully in tune with spirit or truth and which prevents us from realizing our true nature. Somewhere else, Guruji said, karma is actually the teaching mechanism that spirit implanted, again, in that outgoing creation from the very beginning that would ultimately prevent incarnate souls from being caught forever in the outward pull of delusion. And as just said, of course, it doesn't mean that our karma is not intense at times, but it helps greatly, again, to reframe for ourselves that karma is not a punishment in a certain sense, but merely, profoundly, but merely a mirror, a reaction to who we've been and who we are now. And some of that karmic package of who we are is just the personality 
that has developed over all those existences and is unique to each individual creation or spark. You know, each one of us here, we're, we're, we're so much the same, but we're so different. It's amazing how, how wonderfully different and individual and unique we all are. And of course, as regards reincarnation, it's that personality that we are often so interested in knowing about who we were, you know, what great person we might have been or must have been, you know, <laughs> certainly a king or a queen, you know, or a duke or duchess at the very least. Again, not realizing, if you study history, you realize these are some of the most miserable people that have ever lived, <laughs> you know? I don't say that joyously. It's just like you, you, you realize, you know, it's something, and Ma said, see, we want, we want immortality, we want fame, and in that individual ignorance, we seek it in a limited way. We want to be known forever because we want to get back in touch with our immortality. And so, but in those roles, if you see it, you know, they don't know who they can trust. They always have to watch their back. Or when they get to that, achieve that pinnacle of power and success in this world, then they say, I'm still not satisfied. In fact, perhaps you heard that story before, how in the early days when our master was in New York, he said a woman who was helping with the office work confided in him how she had met a psychic who had told her wonderful things about herself, including the revelation, he said that in a former life she had been Mary, Queen of Scots. And our master said, I did not believe she had been that queen. And I silently uttered a little prayer that God would banish her delusion. And then he said, a few days later, another student came to see me and with great excitement said, I have just met a famous psychic the same one the office worker had mentioned, who told me that in a past life, I was Mary, Queen of Scots. <laughs> and our master said, I asked the office worker to come into the room. And placing the two queens face to face, <laughs> I asked, which one of you is the real Mary, Queen of Scots? <laughs> and Guruji said, the ladies happily realized their mistake. In telling this story on another occasion, he said, people who go to fortune tellers or others to try to learn about their past incarnations really want to be flattered. He said, they don't want to hear that they were an average or an evil individual. They want to be told they were a great king, a famous person, or a saint. In fact, our master himself had this further story to tell, and again, it's so wonderful hearing it in his own words. He said, once I was sitting with some students in a gathering, where a gypsy was present. Everyone was flocking around this fortune teller. I was quietly observing her. Soon I realized she was not actually answering what they asked her, but rather some query she was cleverly putting to them. The students then urged me to have my fortune told. And he went on, the room was rather dark, so the gypsy couldn't see me too clearly. So in a high, squeaky voice, I asked, when will I divorce my husband? <laughs> and Guruji is so wonderful. <laughs> she quickly responded, right away. Then I stood up and she saw my trousers below my robe. You deceived me, she exclaimed angrily. Supposedly, she was reading our minds, but I had read hers. And he said, because of my long hair, she had thought I was a woman. And that is why I tested her with that question. You know, I've come to realize, and now I'm talking to those who consider themselves disciples of this path. And I've come to realize that, that if we want to know or need to know about our past incarnations, our guru will make it known to us. You know, there's no greater fortune teller than him now at this point of our lives. In fact, he told once how, you know, having that long hair and also in the early days wearing a turban, someone in fact asked him once if he himself was a fortune teller, to which he replied, no, but I do tell people how they can mend their fortunes. And that's the great power and blessing 
of the guru, our guru, is because he can see and knows all of those past incarnations that we as his disciples have gone through, that he can guide us correctly, safely. He can, he can look at the continuum of everything we've been and where we are now. And that's why he knows and can allow, through his grace actually, some karmic event to come to our life at a particular time that he can see in the context of everything we've ever been and are at this very moment, the exact moment when we'd be in the best position to face that karma and overcome it with his help and blessing and guidance. And so our master said, I would plant one thought in your mind. Without God realization, you wouldn't care to know about your past lives lest you learn of the terrible happenings that have taken place in those previous incarnations. He said, think of the troubles and sorrows you have had in this life, and then think of your many past incarnations. Do not believe for one moment that you have not had equally painful or worse experiences in those earlier lives. He said, would you want to remember all you have gone through from the beginning of your creation? No because to do so would so depress and discourage you that from the beginning you would have no strength, no will to keep on. And he said once that oblivion is one of the most gracious of mental anesthetics that the Lord has given us. And so what is the master's advice regarding all this? Just do our best now. As he said, forget the past, for it is gone from your domain. Forget the future, for it is beyond your reach. Control the present. Live supremely well now. It will whitewash the dark past and compel the future to be bright. This is the way of the wise. And if we adopt these attitudes, we are truly keeping company with the greatest of our master's disciples. I remember how flabbergasted, you might say, I was. I think that's the best word. When I, I remember reading in a letter that Sister Ganamata had written to Guruji in the book God Alone, where she said she herself didn't even remember her past incarnations. I thought, wait a minute, she's... She's the most advanced, or what are the most advanced women disciples our master has? I thought by that time you'd, you'd get to know all the kings and queens that we were in our previous life. <laughs> you, know, you have fun with your realization at that point. But she didn't even know. I remember also an incident with our former president, Sri Mata, and how during her lifetime at a particular point, some rumors started to circulate about some saint she perhaps might have been in a former life. And I remember how she called all the monastics together for a satsang to address this, and she expressed how deeply concerned she was about this kind of diversion and the unnecessary and unproductive attention of it all. And I remember how she pleaded with us, saying, don't do this, my dears. And then she concluded, let it just be said that in a former life, I was someone who loved God. Isn't that perfect? And then she said, it is the only way I would wish to be remembered in any incarnation. And really, again, that love seems to be a theme this week is what it is ultimately all about. I remember sitting once with a close family member toward the end of their life, and they couldn't speak much anymore. And as I was with them that day, they were looking at me had an odd expression in their eyes. And then I, I caught their thought. And I, and I said, oh, you're not afraid of death, of the unknown and, and of dying itself. I said, you're afraid not knowing if you will ever see me again. And, and they were so relieved, I could see that I, because they couldn't express that I had got their sentiment. And I just looked at them and I, and I asked, I said, what does your heart tell you? And then they smiled, and they were at peace. And afterwards, I recalled a story I had heard once about the relationship. In this case, it was between a well-known emperor 
of the past and how a very close member of his family was at the end of life and asked similarly if they would ever meet again. And he answered in the same way, be assured we will meet again. He said, it is too necessary not to be true. There's something intuitive about that answer. And again, the other night, uh, Brother Nikulananda was sharing that letter that Ma had written in him. He shared that personal story about his mother and how she was saying, of course they will meet again. And she said, of that type of reunion between souls, there can be no doubt. And so I want to wrap up all our thoughts tonight with this final perspective on reincarnation. Again, from the Self-Realization Fellowship lessons, our master poses the following series of questions. He says, is there any satisfying explanation why we are given certain ones to love? And why? Perhaps before our love for them has fully matured, they are mysteriously taken away from us by the cruel hand of death. Is nature a jester that takes pleasure in seeing lovers separated and that mocks at man's sacred vows of loyal love and friendship? Is parental love merely instinct instigated? Is conjugal love only nature and sex instigated? Is friendship born only of passing emotions? Is the dream of eternal love between souls a mockery of imagination? And he goes on, is it through a vagrant whim of nature that some souls are thrown together so that they become attached to one another? Or is it because of similar actions of previous lives, similar dispositions, like tendencies? Is it prenatal acquaintance, friendship, and love that brings souls together? Has God made of us intelligent puppets to play out his life dramas, only to be destroyed in the end of his will? Has he made some of us poor, some of us rich, some idiotic or wise, merely to fill his stage of life with variety, pulling us back at death into his bosom? Is this life the beginning and the end? Are souls created for only one lifetime, as various types of mentalities that will be attracted to one another through similar likes and dislikes, only to part forever in death? Is love just a chemical affinity that loses its strength after a certain period of temporary union, so that in death, lovers must part forever? Is nature or destiny jesting with friendship and with true love between souls? Questions such as these come to mind as we travel through life. And then he says, the answer to them all lies in this explanation. Divine love is trying to express itself in human souls through the various avenues of conjugal and parental love and the love of friendship. And he said, all the various relationships of family, society, and nationality among living creatures, even among animals, birds, and flowers, are but catalysts of life intended to purify and convert earthly love into divine love. And so, in effect, that great universal spirit that expanded all forms out from itself at the very beginning of creation had and has as its one eventual purpose to draw everything back into itself, into its bliss, into our bliss, through that greater attraction of love. And I was actually surprised when I first read through those particular lessons to learn how, in a way, Guruji challenges those who say they truly love to not forget the love or true friendship begun in those various relationships, but he said to continue to perfect them from life to life, that we might find through that experience, he said, the love of God and divine love for all. He said once, in the sorrow of separation from their loved ones through death, the unwise cry for a while and then forget. The wise feel the intuitive impulse within to seek their lost loves in the heart of infinity. And in those lessons, he even gives techniques and instructions for how to do so. Some of you might recall the story Master told how he once went to see a movie about Abraham Lincoln, who, again, Brother Nikulananda referenced a bit during his class the other night. And Guruji said how he was watching that great hero on the screen, deeply appreciating his noble deeds, when suddenly he was killed. And Master said he felt very sad. But then he said he thought to himself, 
Why feel sorrow? I will wait until the picture starts again and he is reborn. <laughs> and he said, so I sat through the showing until I had again felt the inspiration of his life. Then I said, now let me leave before he dies. <laughs> so in a sense, being free of reincarnation is not the goal, but expanding our hearts to encompass the love of God is. And that's what makes us free. Sometimes you might hear people say, I can't wait to that, get out of here. And when I do, I'm never coming back. Okay, got it. We, we understand. It's brutal at times. The sufferings, the trouble of it all in these bodies, no question. It's huge. But then contrast that with something I heard once that Swami Vivekananda said when one of his followers asked him if he would ever come back. And you know what he said? He said, oh, I may have to reincarnate on this earth again and again because I've fallen in love with mankind. <laughs> and so Sri Dayamada said, these are the greatest lovers. Like our master who expressed in his poem, God's Boatman, where he said, oh, I will come again and again, crossing a million crags of suffering with bleeding feet, I will come, if need be a trillion times so long as I know one stray brother or sister is left behind. So who loves like that? Who can keep a promise like that? And I think I shared before how our, our dear president, Sri Mirali Mata, was with the monks once, and she was relating this particular poem and passage, and how when she finished reading the words, how he would come back a trillion times, if need be, how she paused at that point and looked up at all the monks and said, but let us not add to his burden and be the last one. <laughs> and I think it's safe to say, I don't think I was the only monk in that crowd that, you know, uneasily looked away a bit so as not to catch her eyes, lest I be that poor soul, that, uh, <laughs> keeping everyone else waiting. So in conclusion, we have these great, great doesn't do it, incomparable. There are no words to describe the, the path, the teachings. We feel that it swells within us each time, each year we come back and reconnect. So we have these great teachings that explain the path, the difficulties and challenges to be overcome, and the ways and means of doing so. We have our guru, the help of the guru, and all the gurus behind him, and we have his and their promise, again, their eternal promise, immortal promise to guard and guide us. No matter how many lives or how many days and nights of Brahma it might take until we are free. In one of the letters our master wrote to his beloved Rajasi, he said, life is strange. We are here and we are here not. We meet and we part. Why we meet and why we part, very few people know. Life comes from the invisible, like a visible river. We are the bubbles in it. Then it ends in the invisible. The bubbles melt in the invisible. And he said, God alone has the key to this great secret. In the meantime, we must patiently wait, for all will be well in the end. Before we close, I was reminded of a so-called, they're called bloopers, and we are sometimes applied to this in, in ordering books or items from Self-Realization Fellowship. Someone might mix up the title a bit, which at times conveys an additional and sometimes very delightful meaning. And so we have this book of one of the master's talks entitled, Where Are Our Departed Loved Ones? But instead, someone asked for a copy once of How to Get Along with Our Departed Loved Ones. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess sometimes we find we're still fighting with each other, <laughs> even from the astral world. So no, just send love and renew that friendship or resolve that fight and transform it into friendship in another incarnation. I thought we might close by 
reading the poem from our guru's book of the same title, Whispers from Eternity. And it's from the section of the book entitled, Experiences in Superconsciousness and Messages to Devotees. So this is his message to us. So let us close our eyes, and then afterwards we'll pause for a brief moment of silence. And Guruji wrote, The eternal voice softly said to me, Through thy slumber of ages, I whispered, Wake thyself. Thou hast forsaken thy sleep. So now I say, Wake thy brothers. Work thou with me, that all men hear my word. I shall broadcast thy message, I promised. And when I leave my earthly form, I shall borrow thine omnipresent voice to murmur within each receptive heart, oh, listen to his soul solacing songs. My countless brothers and sisters, I shall wait for all as they slowly travel in a seemingly endless procession toward the blissful goal of self-realization through whispers from eternity, I shall gently say, awake, following his ever-calling voice, let us go home together. Om. Peace. Amen.